Welcome to the News Hour. President Biden and former President Trump have agreed to debate one on one, but without the involvement of the Commission on Presidential Debates, which has run those debates since 1988. Their agreement came after Biden's campaign laid out terms and dates in a letter this morning, and Biden issued this challenge. Well, make my day, pal. I'll even do it twice. So let's pick the dates, Donald. I hear you're free on Wednesdays. To which Mr. Trump replied online, quote, let's get ready to rumble. Both have accepted offers from CNN and ABC to take part in June and September debates, respectively. For more on this, I'm joined by Republican strategist Kevin Madden and Democratic strategist Faz Shakir. Great to see you both. Thank you for being here. Great to be here. Before we jump into the conversation, I think it's worth reminding everyone what it was like when these two faced off back in September of 2020 in their first debate. Here's a clip. The, the new question Supreme is: Court Justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut who is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so list? right, gentlemen. Is, I think this we've is ended so this. He's going to pack the court. We have end, oh, no, no. not going to give a list. We have Faz, why did the Biden campaign decide to do this now? Well, there's a lot of reasons, of course, Hamna. One is um, I think they have a sense that they're behind at the moment. You've got to have a debate with Trump. You've got to re-remind tr people about Trump's record. You've got to engage him on the debate. But what would you do about the economy? What, what's your tax plan? Well, all those basic questions they got to do sooner rather than later. That's the other element. They'd like it to happen faster so that they can go bring some intensity and energy back into this race among their Democratic coalition. Okay, so Kevin, the terms as they've laid out, the Biden campaign has laid out, we don't know if Mr. Trump has agreed, but the terms are no audience in a TV studio with a moderator. The mics get cut off after an allotted time. Will Mr. Trump agree to those, and will he stick to those? Well, look, I, yeah, I think he will agree to them because he does want to debate. I think, first of all, though, one of the important things about campaigns and debates in campaigns is managing expectations. I think we have to manage the American public's expectations around whether or not this is going to be a very substantive-driven debate. You see it now with the candidates, the way that they're sort of framing the terms of it. It has a little bit more of a, you know, a WWF match uh, quality to it than a real substantive debate. But Trump really wants to uh, demonstrate that he has better command, better control over the, uh, the issues. And he can put Joe Biden, in his view, on the defensive and also, I think, draw the age contrast, which he thinks works in his favor. Well, we will see. In the meantime, there are some primary results this week that show us what this race could look like, some of the issues and where Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump could face challenges ahead. If you look at Nebraska's results in particular, Kevin, they show Mr. Trump, the clear winner here, right, 80 percent of the vote. But Nikki Haley pulled nearly 18 percent. She dropped out in early March, Kevin. She's been racking up sizable numbers in GOP primaries since then, 22 percent in Indiana, 16 percent in Pennsylvania. Who are those voters, and why don't they like Mr. Trump? It's a good question, and it's an interesting trend line that she keeps holding that 20 percent line all the way through this late in the game. Look, these are conscientious objectors inside the Republican Party. They not, they're not happy with Donald Trump as the nominee, and they're sort of offering protest vote for that. This should be an alarm bell for the Trump white, for the for, for, for Trump, the Trump campaign. But it is not necessarily a death knell right now. This is his charge. From here all the way through to November, he has to figure out a way to get these voters back. The good news for the Trump campaign is that the, the, the issues that are really motivating these voters are issues like inflation and immigration. Mm -hmm. So he has a message frame that I think is still going to be able to bring these voters back into his fold by, by Election Day. The big risk is that they stay home. As you know, Mr. Biden faces some headwinds with black voters in particular. There was some new numbers from the New York Times Siena poll this week that showed in key battleground states, 63% uh, of black voters went for President Biden, 23% for President Trump. But while Mr. Biden has the clear majority, the analysis showed that 23% would be the highest level of black support for any Republican presidential candidate since the enactment of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. What does that say about the campaign right now? Well, it's not only concerning among black voters. If you look at Latino voters in Nevada, it's also the, uh, a concern. You look at young voters, of course, we know that there's some challenges there, and he, Biden's got to start performing more strongly. I, I, that, I use that word advisedly, strong, hmm. because at this moment, one of the challenges that Trump has on Biden is the question of who's a strong leader. And I think for all of the progressive policymaking that you've seen President Biden do, it hasn't been coupled with the politicking. If you look at the fact that his FTC and the DOJ, they take on these big cases, we do junk fees, we got Pete Buttigieg going after airlines. Do you see the fact that this policymaking is taking on 
powerful interests, that this president is strong to take them on, Big Pharma, you name them. He's got the agenda, but the politicking doesn't match that agenda yet. And he's got to dial up the, the question of, am I a strong leader with a strong, firm hand on the steering wheel and a vision for the next four years in the politicking, mm -hmm. not so much on the agenda, just reassuring that voting base who is largely driven by an economic narrative that this president is strong and ready to take them on. There's a few Senate primary results I want to put to you too because as you know it's currently a 51-49 split. Uh, Democrats in the majority there in Maryland. Angela also Brooks beat David Trone in the Democratic primary. She's now going to face Republican Governor Larry Hogan for a seat that a Democrat is freeing up, Ben Cardin. In West Virginia, meanwhile, Jim Justice, the governor, won the Republican Senate primary. That's also going to be an open seat being vacated by Joe Manchin. Kevin, when you look at those results, Maryland is particularly interesting because Hogan is popular because he's kept things local and he's focused on his state. He will surely be pulled into national politics. How, how will he fare there? Well, you know, it is a, I think it's a tough challenge right now for national Democrats when they look at that state. That should be a traditional Democratic stronghold. But you do. You have a very popular governor, somebody who's seen as more of a moderate, somebody who is focused on a lot of the pragmatic issues that really drive suburban voters that I think are going to be important in that state. So um, I think one of the big challenges for the Democrats is uh, how, how much resources do they really put into that state? Um, and if those resources are going into Maryland, are they not going to a state like Ohio or a state like Montana, which is really going to affect the balance of the Senate map. So I feel like it's advantage Republicans right now when you look at the overall Senate map. New Maryland is still a very tough traditional Democratic state. This, if this is going to be a race that's pretty hard fought. But the fact that you're taking resources from other states, I think, bodes well for the Republicans. Could Dems lose I, control of the Senate? I'm not too worried about Maryland. I think it also Brooks is a strong Democratic contender. And I think I would have been more worried had it been David Trone, a person who spent $61 million of his own money and didn't win <laughs> people over. So I think you got a stronger candidate. Biden will overperform, beat Trump by a lot. In order for Hogan to win, he'd have to way overperform Trump. But uh, he's going to be dragged by his own problems of being challenged but, uh, to defend Trump's record. I think the map in general, if you look at Democrats, is hard to maintain the majority. Mm -hmm. However, it's still lined up where you have a very strong chance to maintain a status quo. I think if you look at Ohio, Montana, the places that Republicans were hoping for pickups, Democrats are in strong positions there. You look at Wisconsin, where Tammy Baldwin's the senator, Bob Casey in Pennsylvania continued to maintain strength, where Kristen Sinema's retiring, Ruben Gallego, a good candidate, who I think will maintain that seat against Kerry Lake. So I think it's still set up, but the fact that you're losing Joe Manchin, West Virginia, it's not clear where the pickup for mm -hmm. a Democrat would be this cycle. I mean, there's some outside the box candidates, and one is in Nebraska, Dan Osborne, independent candidate, no, unclear who he'd side with, but I think a pro union guy who's running against Deb Fisher, that's my outside the box race. We'll take outside the box takes anytime. Pastor Kevin Madden, always great to see you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.